Uh, hi everyone, welcome to MOCA um, on a Thursday night. Um, again, my name is Brian Barson. I'm a curator here at MOCA. Um, so, how many of you, this is your first time here at this museum? Oh, a good amount of you. Okay, well welcome for the first time. Um, one of the things that our museum is known for is for having one of the best, best collections of contemporary art on the West Coast. Um, a collection is the pieces that the museum buys or acquires and we have them and we can put them on whenever we like. Um, last year we celebrated the museum's 40th anniversary. Um, and to do that we wanted to do something different with the permanent collection um, which more often, the typical thing to do is for us, the curators, to go into the collection and make exhibitions with them. So that whole other part of the museum that you saw that's open right now is all sort of thematic exhibitions that we've made with the permanent collection. So for the 40th anniversary, we wanted to do something different and invite artists to look at the permanent collection, to come to know it, to treat it like a library in some ways of an, a knowledge base here at the museum. So um, this is the second iteration in a series of exhibitions that we began last year where we've asked artists to come into the permanent collection, do research and think about their own practice, the work of other artists here in LA, um, how artists can use the collection as educators. Um, basically it's a new way to think about the permanent collection. We at this museum haven't done that before so it's the first time that we do it. Um, this is the second iteration of that series. Um, and we asked an artist named Galaporis Kim, who is a Colombian-Korean artist who lives here in LA. Um, that's one of the stipulations of this open house series, is that it had to be a Los Angeles-based artist. It has to be artists who come to MOCA, know MOCA, really think of this institution as part of their community. Um, so Gala um, is a young artist. She's uh, 34, I believe. Um, Colombian-Korea, she was born in um, Colombia to um, a Korean mother and a Colombian father. Her father was uh, part of the Colombian militia, the FARC, and um, had to leave. And she grew up um, mostly here in LA with her Korean family, her Korean mother's family. Um, Gala's practice is really interesting because she doesn't produce a lot of objects. More often than not, the work that she does is related to permanent collections like this one. The difference here being is that she's never worked with a permanent collection, I'm uh, sorry, a contemporary collection. She often works with Mesoamerican artifacts or um, artifacts from the Middle East that are in museums. So she goes into these museums and looks at these artifacts and tries to figure out how museums got these objects. So where did they come from? Who bought it? Who took it from where? What are the, what are the um, situations by which these objects came to exist? Um, the other thing is how museums work to categorize different objects. So often museums will get a remnant, not the whole piece. They won't know how the piece was made. They won't know how the piece was used. And the museums do this work in trying to figure out the history of the object, how it was used, right? So her practice is really about investigating these circumstances within museums. And what she makes are sometimes sculptures. She was in the last Whitney Biennial with a piece that investigated an Olmec statue in a language, um, the language of which has never been deciphered. So she tried to make all these different systems by which we could try to figure out what the language was and um, all these interventions into recreations of the statue. Sometimes her practice is word documents. Um, she made a, a, a piece recently that was the collection policy of a museum and then she made word document comments on it on how it could change to incorporate better um, a better relationship with the artist. Um, at LACMA she did a project in 2017. They have a huge collection of Mesoamerican um, artifacts that all came through one gentleman who basically looted and plundered all these objects from the native communities for a really long time. Um, and her goal with this project was just to change the labels of all the exhibition, of all the objects so that they would spell out how these objects came into collection. Because often, and what you'll see in our labels too, in every museum label is it says gift of someone, right? But who is that person? How did they get this object? Where did they buy it? And then how did the museum get it from there? Those are questions that she's getting to the root of. So that's a long-winded introduction to say that that's what we wanted to think about when we were thinking about this permanent collection. What are the unique factors about working with a permanent collection um, of contemporary art? So 
artists that didn't live 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, but that are alive today. Um, and after a long time, we came up with this idea about thinking of, about the collection as a living thing, right? Like, what is it? Uh, uh, we think about museum collections as these things that sit in a vault, right? And they, we buy them or they're gifted to us and they stay in the same condition as the day that we got them, right? But that's not actually the case. In reality, museums have to make a lot of decisions, not only in terms of conservation, but how objects are displayed, how um, we try to make the artist's intentions come to life, um, how objects, whether we like it or not, because of the materiality of them, will change over time. So basically, we wanted to think about um, the way that museums steward their collection. What is the process by which um, we conserve, think about work, reinterpret it for audiences going forward. So every object that you see, uh, the 14 or 15 objects that you see in this exhibition have some sort of unique challenge um, that present themselves to the museum. Um, whether it be conservation, sourcing materials, um, intention of the artist, desires, and I'm gonna walk you through a few of them so you can give you an example of what the kind of challenges are. Um, I don't want to say problems because they're not problems. These are things that are come inherent with um, maintaining a house or maintaining anything. I mean, the ob objects aren't the same when you buy them as when you as the years go on. So um, a really sort of straightforward example is this piece right here called Provisorium by um, Franz West. So this is a piece that's covered in um, silver, silver leaf, right, and. When we acquired this piece, um, it was silver, completely silver, right? And over the course of the last 10 years, it's gone, of course, getting a patina that silver will always get, right? So that's, the artist was accounting for that. He knew that over time, this piece is gonna change, it's gonna change. So, and we'll never have the piece that we got originally. We'll never have anything that looks like it. And the, the idea is, okay, well, can't you guys conserve it? Can't you take the tarnish off? Well, A, do we want to do that? The point is that the artist wanted the piece to sort of tarnish over time. And B, he's made it in such a way that the silver is so thin that if you tried to conserve it, you would have what's called losses. So the silver leaf would, would fall apart and we would no longer be able to conserve it. So the title of the piece is Provisorium. It's provisional. It can only last for a certain time in the state it's in. It's always going to be changing. So this is a, a really interesting example of how artists account for change in their work. They know it's going to change. And in fact, they encourage that sort of change. So this piece over here, this light bulb. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with the work of Dan Flavin, um, there's one in the galleries over there. It's the fluorescent light bulbs. This is not a Dan Flavin. It just looks like a Dan Flavin. The reason we wanted to have this in this piece is because this is a Dan Flavin light bulb. It's not the piece, it's a light bulb from the piece, right? So when people like Dan Flavin, Mary Corse, uh, maybe not Terrell because his is a little bit more um, complicated practice, but when they were making these light and space pieces in the 50s and 60s, they were getting off the shelf materials, right? They were going to the hardware store and saying, okay, let's work with this bulb. So we get them into our permanent collection, but they don't make these bulbs anymore. These used to be off the shelf components, but they don't make them anymore. So in reality, the museum starts keeping these light bulbs, which are gotten from a hardware store, as if they were artworks themselves, right? And now a piece of, of a bulb that or a bulb that was at once, you know, cheap, inexpensive, available becomes something not only special uh, either very prized as a resource, or we have to get specialty manufacturers to remake those bulbs to a certain tone, a certain color. So while this isn't necessarily a piece of art, right? This is um, a light bulb that's part of a sculpture, right? But it isn't the sculpture, but what happens when these people start making it? What happens when these bulbs are no longer available? Something that was a ready-made, something that was available widely in commercial, now becomes an art object again because specialty people have to make it. So it's another challenge that museums have to think about is how do we maintain these pieces? How do we get the resources that we need to maintain it? This piece here um, is a similar example in a very different way. This is a piece by Wolfgang Leib, who's a German artist called uh, Pollen from Dandelions. So this piece, um, it's a pane of glass, and he collects pollen 
in his uh, in a er, sort of rural area of Germany that he lives, he collects specific p kinds of pollen. This pollen is from 1978, so um, it comes in a jar. What we have in our collection is a jar and a pane of glass. And every time we install this piece, um, it takes about three hours. It, we sift the pollen onto this glass, right? And each time we do it, we lose a little bit of the pollen into the air, into the ground, into the bottom of people's shoes. Like it's the reality of having a piece of art. This pollen is not stuck to it. So every time we install it, it's getting thinner and thinner, right? So in theory, we could conserve it. We could get more pollen from this place. However, the availability of pollen is dependent on the availability of bees and the availability of butterflies, the availability of that area having dandelions, stuff that's really out of our control. How are we going to get pollen from dandelions if there's no dandelions, if there's no bees? So in reality, yes, in theory we could get more pollen, but it's really dependent on things outside of the museum, outside of the art world. Um, this piece here, and then we'll move into the next room, um, this piece here is a work by Felix Gonzalez Torres. So, um, this museum has the unique and strange um, benefit or, or, or circumstance that this is the same sculpture. We, have, we own two of the exact same sculpture. There are two editions of Felix Gonzalez Torres's Last Light. And Felix Gonzalez Torres, while he was alive, um, made sure to write in all the um, administrative papers when you collect one of his works that the way that they were installed was completely contingent on how the curators or the person who owned or the museum who owned his sculptures wanted to do it. So that there was not one way that his sculptures had to look. Um, the only stipulation that we have of this sculpture is that you either show it with all the lights on or all the lights off. That's the only stipulation. He even goes so far to say in these things that this piece should always look like a light. Now, if the definition of light changes in 20, 30, 40 years, then you should change the light and the fixtures to match what the definition of a light is, a standard light, um, during the time that the viewers are seeing it installed. So what Gal and I wanted to do with this one is show the same sculpture two very different ways. So one, of course, is strung up, and the other one is sort of laid on the floor like this. And both of those are completely, uh, completely the intent of the artist. They're both true to the artist, and they're exactly how the piece has been shown. So you're seeing one sculpture, or sorry, two sculptures, the same sculpture, but in totally different ways that are still exactly the same piece. I mean, it's a, these are all the sort of things we think about. Um, this piece here, just to, before we move in the other room, is a John Chamberlain's uh, foam piece. He made this, uh, I want to say in the 70s, right? No, 60s, sorry, 60s. So this is a piece made of urethane foam. And as you can see, if you look closely, it has some discoloration. It uh, has little chunks missing. Um, so it looks like it's been, you know, uh, had a long life and has weathered, right? This is what we call a non-archival material, which means a material that um, will not be stable. Even if you treat it with the best care in the world, things are gonna, it, it will eventually fade because it was not made to last forever, right? Like everything has to be conserved. Painting, sculpture, everything you see in this museum has to be conserved, but some things are much harder to conserve because they weren't, um, let's say, tried and true art materials. Like paint, you put a varnish on it, you can clean that with water, with a Q-tip with water every hundred years, um, you know, stone and all these things. There are materials that we can never conserve. This one here we wanted to show, not because it can't be conserved, but because we're not sure whether the artist knew that this material was, in fact, falling apart. And if he did know that it was falling apart, he would want it to fall apart. He wouldn't want us to conserve it. So we're not sure if the damage to this piece is intentional or unintentional, right? So what are we supposed to do? The artist is dead. We can contact the estate, right? And the estate might have an answer, but we'll, re we'll never really know what the artist really wanted to do with this piece. So it's, the, again, these sort of issues of how does a museum handle the work that it owns. This is um, a film by Walter De Maria, which um, he, the interesting thing about 16 millimeter film, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to talk over the piano, but um, about 16 millimeter film, when you see it in a museum, is that um, when museums show film, they make one copy 
per week of the film. Because when you put film on a looper, so a film projector, it tears it and it stretches it. So we never use the original film that we got. Often what we get is a negative that we make 15 copies of, or 20 copies, or how many weeks we're showing the exhibition. So in reality, when you're seeing a film, like you know, when you see a looper and a projector, you're seeing many, many copies, or the film is digitized. So you don't, it's not on film anymore, it's transferred to a Blu-ray or to a hard drive, so you don't get to see the original film. What we wanted to do is this is the only time in a museum you will ever see the actual f film itself, right? So it comes in this box, it's kept in this like sort of tin, but no other time that you see film in a museum are you ever seeing the actual film that the artist made, you're only seeing a copy. This, however, is the actual film that the artist made. Um, so it's an interesting, you're never really seeing the actual film. So this is, um, this is a piece called 44th Wire Piece by Richard Tuttle. Um, for this piece, the artist comes and he does the drawing on the wall and then shapes the wire um, in relation to the drawing. Sometimes um, it changes each time he does it. But the thing that I wanted to point to is the fact that the artist is the only person that can install this piece. He has it in the instructions of this work that he must be flown in and install this piece. Um, for this installation, he came two weeks ago on a Friday. He came for the day all the way from Bar Harbor, Maine to LA just for the day to install this work. He did it for 20 minutes and then flew back. Okay, so, I mean, he really means it. And the reason we wanted to install this piece and have him come is because Richard Tuttle is 78 years old. He's only installed this piece one other time at this museum, and we wanted for him to install it because A, let's be real, it might be the last time that he installs this piece, the last time that we can install this piece. And we wanted to ask him when we come, okay, Richard, do you have a plan for how do we continue to show this piece after you're no longer available to show the piece? So he came, he installed it, he does a sort of ritual in front of it. And then I asked him, I said, Richard, you know, what do we do? Do we film you? Do you want to teach someone how to do this? He's like, nope. I said, well, what do we do? He said, I'm not ready to talk about that yet. And he flew back. So I, have, I don't have an answer for what will happen to this after Richard is no longer available to install the piece. So this may be the last time that you see this piece because, yes, we can make a template. We can take pictures of it. But according to the artist, he's the one that has to install it. If he doesn't install it, then it's not the piece, right? So this might be the last time that we have this, this piece on view. Hopefully not, but you know. Um, this is another Felix Gonzalez Torres piece, um, A Corner of Bocce, and this is sort of like the Wolfgang Live piece and the pollen. Um, for this, this piece is called Untitled, A Corner of Bocce. Bocce is a candy made by Perugina. Um, Perugina is a brand that was bought by Nestle. Um, we have no control as a museum, as an art world, if Perugina continues to make bocce. What happens if there's no more bocce in the world? What happens if they stop making it? If they change the color of the wrapper? If they no longer include love messages inside? All that changes the characteristics of the piece, but we have no control over that. Um, and Felix Gonzalez Torres did leave some leeway for including a different kind of candy, but he said in the paperwork that it must be replaced with a different kind of candy with love messages of different languages inside. No other candy with different languages of love messages inside is being made right now. So we have no other option but to use this bocce, but tomorrow Perugina could decide to stop making bocce and this piece would stop existing in the world. It would no longer to do, we don't care, we don't have, you know, tons and tons of bocce sitting in a freezer downstairs. Every time we want to remake the piece, call Perugina and say, hey, we need $5,000 worth of bocce, and you can all take one. That you can, the idea of this sculpture is that you, all of you can come and take one of these bocce. It's a love message from Felix to you. But as you're taking it, I'm like, you know, be careful. There might not be that much more in the world. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the piece in the middle of the room is a piece by Walid Beshti, and Walid Beshti um, is a Lebanese-American artist. He lives here in LA. Um, he makes this glass cube. He then puts, he makes it specifically the size of the FedEx container underneath it, and then he ships it. He ships it to the venue where it's gonna be shown. Um, FedEx is a great company, but not that great, so cracks form in the piece, right? 
it's shown, right? We keep the cracks. The, ch the piece of the title, the ch uh, excuse me, the title of the piece changes to include the FedEx number that it's shipped with, right? Then it comes back to the museum. The title changes to include the next FedEx number. The, cl the crack, it continues to crack and continues to crack and we lend, it, we lend it to other institutions. It continues to crack. The title begins to grow and grow and grow. Um, one day, it's gonna crumble. There's, it's gonna fall apart. I mean, it's shatterproof glass, but after a certain point, you can see in the corners, it's starting to fall apart. What do we show then? Do we show the pile of glass left in the, <laughs> on the box? Do we open the box? Like, you know, we really have to think about what we're gonna do with this piece after it reaches its inevitable demise. Um, the other thing um, we wanna put is sometimes artists change their mind. Right, so we get a piece into our collection and later they decide, well, that's not exactly the, what I wanted to do, that's not exactly the piece I wanted. So MoCA um, in 1985 collected a piece called Double Negative. It's a piece of land art out in the Nevada desert and this is a picture of it. It's a cut across a valley. So this is about 10 feet wide and it's about 120 feet from that end to this end and it exists in the Nevada desert. Anyone can go and see it, it's free and open to the public. Um, we've owned it since 1985. It was the first piece of land art. So when Michael Heiser, or sorry, excuse me, Virginia Dwan donates it to MoCA. Um, there's all this fanfare in the news and Michael Heiser says it's beautiful because it's gonna, I don't want it to be conserved. I want it to flow back into nature as the rain, the, the wind, the earthquakes shake the ground. Eventually these walls will fall and it will return to nature. What I carved out of nature will return to nature. Well, um, that's cool and we like that and that's beautiful and poetic, but in 2006 and 2010 he did an interview with the New Yorker and then one with the LA Times and he said, well I hate the way it looks now. It looks so dirty, it doesn't look like the way I made it, I want them to conserve it. Well, but that's not what you said when you gave it to us and that's not what the paperwork says. So what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to listen to the 1985 version of Michael Heiser or the 2006 version of Michael Heiser? I mean like, in this case, it might seem clear, but think about a painting or a sculpture. If you got a painting in the collection, like a, a, the Rothko's that you see in the room, and Rothko is still alive, and Rothko comes back and said, oh, that's actually kind of a shitty painting I made. Can I paint it again? And we'd be like, no, of course not. That's what it is. So again, how do we think about our relationship to artists after things go into our permanent collection? Um, this piece here, is really interesting because it, it talks, it, it sort of talks about the way or thinks about the way that things become art, non-art, and back to art. Think about that Dan Flavin, Dan Flavin bulb, how, or the bocce's, or any of those things, how they go from being non-art to art and then back and forth again. This is a piece called Fold for JB by Saul Lewitt. Saul Lewitt, in the 1970s, he does a gift exchange with his friends who are artists. He takes a white sheet of paper, an eight and a half by 11, folds it into squares, sticks it in an envelope, and sends it to his friends. Um, he sends one to the Los Angeles artist, John Baldessari. John Baldessari this, receives this fold and is like, wow, amazing, like I got this piece. He sends it to the framer. The framer loses the paper. Right? He loses the, they lose the paper and send John Baldessari this letter that says, Dear John, I'll read it out because he goes, Dear John, just a letter to confirm our conversation regarding the Saul Lewitt drawing. Due to our carelessness at our factory, we lost Saul's drawing on white paper with the four folds in it. It must have gotten thrown out as a piece of paper. We're extremely sorry and we'll do what is fair to make up for our negligence. Yours truly, the framer. Right? So this is a letter that the framer sends John Baldessari. John Baldessari tells Saul Lewitt and Solowitz says, send me, that, send me that letter. Solowitz gets that letter, folds it like that originally, please, signs it fold for JB, and sends it back to John Baldessari. So this is now fold for JB, right? That originally piece that's lost in the world, this is now it. So he took a, the letter that was about the piece and then made it the piece. So you can see how things can go from being non-art to art if the artist decides it to be so, right? And we respect that choice. Um, this is another example of that. So this is a piece by Rafael Montañez Ortiz. Um, he, since the 1960s, was doing what's called destruction con concerts. Um, and uh, he wrote a, this thing called the Destructivist Manifesto, right? About the destruction of objects and what destruction really means. Um, in 1998, 
we invited him to be part of an exhibition here at MOCA called Out of, Op Out of, Out of Options, <laughs> Out of Actions, um, and it was an uh, exhibition about how the art, uh, objects in, a lot of the objects that like we think about in art are actually spaces for performance. So a, a painting is a space for performance, um, a sculpture about performance itself, right? So when he's destroying these piano, as you see in the video there, he's what he calls is liberating the wood from its colonial form. So this wood, this piano was made out of mahogany, Caribbean mahogany. Um, it was taken from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, one of those places, and carved into this Western form of the piano, right? When he's destroying the piano, he says he's liberating it from its, from its originally form. But you can see the video of him destroying it here. It'll restart in a second. And then he just left it there. It was, it's not really a sculpture. It's not really installation. It's a prop from a performance, right? So he leaves it in the installation and we don't know what to do with it. So he gifts it to us as an art object. But we don't know what this is supposed to look like. He just, it's a, just a bunch of pieces on the floor. Are we supposed to make it look like he originally destroyed it? Or do we build it up as a piano again? So now it came in selection, into the collection and we have a big giant crate and all the pieces just get thrown in it. And this is the first time we show it again since then. And we've contacted the artist. And in all these cases, I want to point out that we contacted the artist if they were alive and said, this is what we want to do with these pieces, just so you know. Um, and he said, well, if you're going to show my piano piece, I really need you to show it with the video of me destroying it. I think that without the piece of me destroying it, it's silent. And it's really important for the audience of that piece to hear what it's like when the piano is being destroyed. It's like the cries of the piano. So what we did was we contacted the UCLA Chicano Art Center that had this documentation of him destroying this exact piano. And now this piece is not only the piano, but the video too. The video is integral to the piece. We can never show it again without the video. Um, the other thing he requested was he said, can you guys plant a mahogany tree to make up for this mahogany that was logged um, to make this piano? So we planted a bunch of seeds of the mahogany tree here around the museum. They may or may not grow because they're supposed to be in the Caribbean, but the gesture is there that we wanted to replenish the wood that was taken um, when they made this, p this piano, which was made for a Bostonian piano company. And I'll, I'll, so you guys can hear the video, I'll shut up for a second. And that is the axe that he used. That was also for some reason kept. So we have the axe that he um, destroyed it with. So in the same way that this changed from being an art piece, then a letter, then back to an art piece, this goes from being a piano to then a performance prop, to then a sculpture or an installation, and that's how we keep it today. And then the last piece I'm gonna talk about um, is this one behind us. So this is a piece by Chris Burden. And the reason we, Gal and I chose this piece is it beca because every single one of the objects in here is non-archival, right? Which again, if we think about the John Chamberlain, no matter what we do to this, the pieces are going to fade away. There's nothing we can do. We can only, you know, we think about the permanent collection as immortal, as it's existing down there in a perfect state of repose. But no matter what we do, we can only enjoy this piece for a certain amount of time. So the cell of, what we did was, sorry, this, what we did was we invited um, two teams of conservators in to look at all these materials. And what I really wanted and what Gala really wanted was for them to say, these Polaroids, taken in 19, I believe it's from 1982, will last 25 years. This cellophane will last 22 years. This, I wanted them to give us precise dates for things. 
And what they said was there's no way for us to predict how long these materials will live. There's just no way. There's too many factors involved. So not only the amount of light it's getting when it's on display, so the more time you guys are looking at it that I put it out here, the less life it has because it's getting light on it. Um, the kind of Polaroid, that, which it was, like what was the brand, the kind of cellophane, right? How many times it's been on display, but because before it came to us, it was owned by somebody else. And how did they have it? Did they have it by a window? Did they have it in a hot part of the house? All that is changing um, the life of these objects. The other thing that's changing the life of these objects, which is bad for it, is it's in a wood frame. Wood frames are actually worse for objects. They off gas, so gases come out of that. And inside, between the paper and the frame, there's a little micro environment. And the Polaroids are off gassing, and the newspapers off gassing, and the cellophane. And in here, there's like a little toxic environment that's sort of making everything fade faster and faster. But w what I thought was really interesting is the idea that no matter how precise we get, we'll never know how long we can have these objects. Like we called in conservators, we did the thing, they took the piece, they measured it. We will never know how long we'll have these objects before they go away. And Chris Burden died about five years ago, six years ago, and I thought it was like sort of a poetic thing that um, we sort of have to enjoy these artworks while they have them, while we have them. They're constantly changing, they're living things in a way, and um, yeah, you guys too. You have to go to museums and see stuff because it's not going to be around. It's not. This stuff can't be. There's no way it can be around forever. Um, and I think that's every object in here. Did anyone have any questions? Okay, you want to hear about that one? Okay, I can talk about that one. Too. I skipped one. So this is a piece by um, Dove Bradshaw, and Dove's work often has to do with. The same, the same idea as Franz West's piece with change in objects. So this piece is called Passion, and um, it is a piece of copper that each time the exhibition, each time we want to show it, we embed it in the wall and spray it with vinegar, right? And what spraying it, that vinegar does, it has acid, the vinegar is acidic, it has acid in it, and it causes the copper to melt a just a little bit and create these blue turquoise streams going down, right? So when we install it, we have to um, spray it for a few days, and that we can never show this one again. Every time we show it, we have to buy a new piece of copper, right? So we're actually destroying the piece in order to show it. But the other thing is, is that despite the fact that we ha are supposed to buy a new one every time and not keep it and destroy the other one, we still keep one, right? We still keep the last one we did as a reference, right? But this is no longer the piece of art. This is just a piece of copper again, right? That at once, at one point, was the same thing here, right? So it was really important for Gala to show how the museum keeps things as a reference when really it shouldn't be a reference. You should, it should be different every single time. And we actually made a publication um, that will accompany this exhibition that'll come out on the 26th if you wanna come back. And it's all the internal documents of all these objects that show sort of like all the lifetime of them. And this piece, there's about four pages in it where at one point Dove, this is called Without Title and it's brass. And then she sends a letter a year later and says, actually, can you call it passion? And it's made out of copper. And then a year later, she sends another thing that says, actually, I like it better called without title and it should be this size. So she's constantly changing the parameters of the piece. Um, and we have all that paperwork to show. Um, so yeah, so everything in, everything in here is like a unique, um, different way to look at a piece. And, and you'll notice that the labels in this room are actually much bigger than the labels throughout the rest of the museum. The reason for that is for Gala and for me, the stories that we're telling here about the materials are the exhibition. We're not really interested in like the aesthetic contemplation of how beautiful this sculpture is. I mean, of course it's beautiful and amazing, but what we're really trying to highlight is these stories that visitors never get to know about the, a permanent collection. Mm -hmm. Was there a conversation in the drafting and research phase of this show affirming that with the problems of these pieces and affecting labels for donors or funds and things of that sort? 
she wasn't that interested in doing it in this case. It wasn't like her, her place of focus. I mean, we talked about a, li a lot of different things, that being one of them, like let's find out where all these, who all, how all these people got these pieces. Um, in my four years at this museum, right, um, and my relationship with when people give art is that once they give it, they don't really want to talk about where it came from. So it's often hard to get people on record. It's often hard to track people down. I mean, we have to be sure, we have amazing donors who give lots and lots of pieces and who have amazing relationships with the museum. But we also have a lot of people who give one-off things who live in Chicago, New York, who spread their collection around other museums. So it's not, it would be a different kind of show. I think than the one she wanted to do here. And I'm sure she will do another show like that because that's what she's really interested in. And her practice now, um, after doing this show, she's at Harvard right now at a Radcliffe Fellowship and she has a year long fellowship there and her whole, the whole research phase of what she's doing is based on this show. And she wants to remake the contract that artists sign when they donate a piece that, al that would allow for artists to have more voice in how their work is shown, maintained, all that throughout the life of a permanent collection. So she's really interested in how artists, how the artist gets to represent themselves in their work at permanent collections. Because often artists don't get to decide how the work looks, what piece, like that could, she could be been like, you know, whoever, okay, so Blake Byrne gave us this and rest in peace, he just died actually, so long. but Blake Byrne gave us this, but it's not like the artist decided to sell it to Blake Byrne nor did the artist decide for Blake Byrne to give it to the museum. So the artist is a few steps removed from their role in the museum. That might have not been the piece that they want to rep represent themselves in a major museum, but it's all circumstantial. It's all basically like relationships and um, you can't, it, it's sometimes out of the control, most of the time out of the control of the artist. Saul Lewitt? Yeah. No, the Richard Tuttle. Richard Tuttle. Yes, so we showed it once before in the 70s and Richard Tuttle came and installed it again and it looked completely different. It's on the cover of our thing. It looked completely different, like not at all. And then a curator who no longer works here showed it again but without having Richard Tuttle come in and install it, right? And I showed Richard Tuttle images of that piece and they did it from a template. They did it from a template of the first time he did it. And he looked at it and he said, that's not my piece. So he knew that it wasn't him who had done that other one. And, he's, and now, this time, it looks completely different from the time he did it the other time. Completely different. And he saw pictures of it. He could have recreated it. He did something completely different. Yeah. I might have missed it. He said after he installed it, he did like a ritual or something? No, he, he does like a sort of preparatory moment. I don't want to say a ritual, but he, he, quote unquote, he channels cosmic love in order to make that piece. But the, there's two lines. One of the, the horizontal, or sorry, the vertical one traces from his shoulder to his hip, so he goes like that. And then the right one is with his other arm, and he traces from his other shoulder down to his hip again. Right, so that's the drawing. And then the wire, I didn't see him do the drawing, the wire, because he wanted to sort of be in his own space, and I didn't want to like crowd him. Um, so it's this it's sort of ritualistic creation of the piece. Any other questions? Okay, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, please. I think that was really the crux of inviting someone for a series like this, right? For Open House, the, the, the interesting thing about having an artist come in is that artists respond to other people's art with art, not with their own art, not often with other people's art, right? Like the artist as curator model is not everywhere. Not all artists can be curators. And that was a fine line to walk with Gala. At times she felt like this is, and times I felt like this is a Gala Porous Kim show. This could be a Gala Porous Kim show. Um, and I welcome that in a certain sense, but I also wanted to be respectful that this is other people's work, right? And that um, she's, 
it's her voice in a way, but it's also the museum's voice, and we have to be respectful of not only that, but a lot of these are gifts of the artists also, and, and they didn't know that their work is gonna be shown in this context, you know? I mean, we're allowed as a museum to show them in the context which, which we see fit because it's our permanent collection, but we also try to be as respectful as possible. So there was a very fine line. I think you could construe this, and, and, and to be honest, it was my kind of sneaky way of getting in a Gallup or a Skim show into the museum. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, keep going. Just keep going. Mm -hmm. Lauren Halsey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Patrick Staff. Yeah, we had. We usually have project rooms in here. The Elliot Hunley, Hunley excuse me, iteration of this was on this side. Right. He did include his own. Right. Did she specifically want to use this space? No. To the of the in no. No, that wasn't part of the discussion. Um, we had to do some shuffling of the exhibition schedule, as most museums do, and this was the space that came, became available. She originally had the low ceiling space back over there, um, but um, no, I don't think she meant it. I don't think she was thinking of the architecture to, to mimic um, an exhibition. I don't think she was like trying to do it in that way. I think the objects herself was, and she wanted unconventional, she wanted to treat a lot of these like materials, right? She like, like the fixture that that Dan Flavin bulb in is not a Dan Flavin fixture either. It's like dirty and crusty and you know, it's one that would, you would have in a workshop. Um, so, no, I, I wish I could say that yes, it was completely planned that it was in this space to mimic what we usually have in here. All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming tonight, and um, please come back after on the 27th, where that curtain will no longer be there, and you'll be able to go in a much uh, bigger exhibition of the pattern decoration movement. And um, yeah, come back. And if you haven't seen the show at the Geffen as well, it also has a lot more of our collection on view. Okay, thank you.